Okay, it's time now. We would like to start the AIU online special seminar. I thank you all for joining this seminar tonight. I'm Yostaka Kumagai, Vice President of AIU, and I will be the moderator tonight. But this AIU online special seminar series was created back in 2020 with the expectation to open student eyes thinking about the future global society with and after COVID-19 and about how we can play an active part in it. Today, we are inviting Dr. Nasrin Ajim from UNITA, United Nations Institute for Training and Research, Hiroshima office. She will give us a talk titled Islam and the greater Middle East. Is it golden age, a distant memory or a possible future? Dr. Ajin is an expert in peacemaking and post-conflict reconstruction. And in addition to the UNITA, she is working for the Green Legacy Hiroshima Initiative as co-founder. The initiative is implementing global campaign to disseminate and plant worldwide seeds and saplings of trees that survived the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. She also launched in 2019 with our president Monte Kassem, the Eden Seminar, which is a platform hosted by Shizenka University aiming at presenting new solution for current global challenges of poverty, conflict, environmental corruption, etc. Today's seminar is attended by the UNITA and Eden Seminars members, as well as AIU students, faculty, and staff members. Well, before starting the seminar, President Kassem would like to greet you all. President Kassem, please. Thank you, Kumagai Sisen. Thank you, Nasreen, for joining us. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, that's good. Well, welcome to AIU, although we would like to see you in person soon, sometime. In any event, uh, it is wonderful to at last be able to have you talk to us about a place I know that is close to your heart and that should be close to all our hearts considering the great civilizations that it has spawned. Uh, however, with the passage of time, we tend to forget these things. Uh, and uh, it is very timely that you brought it back to our notice. And I think our students will also benefit from this depth of historical achievement, which has recently been sadly clouded by events, which I hope humanity can and will avoid in the future. Um, your experience on the ground has been fantastic. You have the ability to see things from above, spot exactly where the problems are, and then hone in to do something to change things. That's, I think, something that we would like our young students and scholars at AIU to learn from as well. Uh, it is, I think, not only timely that you're here with us, but with the world transforming itself with all kinds of birth pangs for what we hope will be a very hospitable future for humanity. How we can work towards not losing hope, but working together to create something that will make the eyes of our young scholars shine and we'll help them to walk with confidence into the future. 
I'm sure your talk will do that, Nasreen, and thank you very much once again for coming. We look forward to hearing more from you as the day passes on. Thanks again. Uh, thank you very much, President. Well, let's have meaningful time, which will include QA after the seminar. Well, Dr. Ajim, then we are looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Munti. Thank you, Kumagai Sensei. Thank you, Satsuma san. I'm really impressed by the whole organization and efficiency of the team. Uh, I wish I were there. I have to say that even before I knew AIU, I knew your library because I'm a lifelong student of uh, architecture. And uh, believe me, when I saw that library uh, in the architecture magazines, I had really regretted that uh, the last and only time I came to Akita, which was maybe about 10 years ago, I could not visit the library. So uh, definitely, whether you invite me or not, I read that the library is always open. So I am going to visit that library and I'm going to sit at those beautiful Akita Sugi desks and enjoy it. Um, I, it is I who must thank you because um, it had been some years since I had replunged into this topic. And uh, these have not been very good years for the region that we're going to discuss. Uh, but I believe not solving or at least not understanding the problems of this region will reflect on the entire world as it has done over the past few decades. So uh, I am often particularly disappointed that there is so little interest in Japan uh, for the area. Silk Road, yes, China, Korea, yes, India, maybe, but the entire world of the Middle East and the greater Middle East seems not to be on the compass of Japanese uh, students. Uh, there are some outstanding Japanese researchers, but they really work somewhat in isolation and in an ad hoc manner. So I think this is something very dear to my heart personally, but also intellectually and professionally. Let me share my screen with your permission. Alors. Okay. okay. Uh, can everybody see the screen? Okay, so this is the stunning Hagia Sophia in Istanbul uh, before Constantinople. Uh, for a thousand years, the capital of the Byzantine Eastern Christianity until its fall in the 15th century to the Ottomans. So it was a church, a cathedral first. It became a church later. In the 1920s or 1930s, uh, the father of Republican Turkey, Ataturk, one of my heroes, uh, changed this into a museum because he believed that Turkey was going to be a secular country and that this church was a heritage of all Turks. And uh, believe it or not, just two years ago, uh, the current president, uh, very Islamist president of Turkey, again changed it to a mosque. So in just one image, you see the richness, the complexities and history that affects this region. Now, uh, Turkey, I have lived in Turkey. I believe Istanbul probably is the most beautiful city in the world in my eyes. Uh, but the beauty and splendor of this region was legend before they became places of war and terrorism and revolution, Baghdad and Damascus um, and Istanbul, they were places of dreams. They were the Paris and London and New York of the time. So uh, here is already one complexity in just one church, you can see how many rival identities uh, are in this region. Uh, the second problem just in this first slide is my very title. This title does not encompass 
all that is happening in the greater Middle East. First, what is the Middle East? The Middle East was perceived from London uh, during the colonial era, uh, looking from London towards its colonies in India, this area became Middle East. Actually, they, there are some writers that suggest we should not call it the Middle East, we should call it the Middle World because so many civilizations started here. I'm reluctant to use Middle World simply because it's a little bit science fiction and takes you in another direction. Uh, but you can see the point. And to only talk of Islam in this region where Christianity was born, Judaism was born, Baha'ism was born, Zoroastrianism was born. A bit further to the east in India, uh, Hinduism was born, Buddhism was born. So to only limit it to Islam, I feel it actually ties my hands together. And then the golden age of Islam is problematic because actually there was a golden age. It lasted practically for five, six hundred years. But it wasn't just Islamic because the scholars and scientists and writers and philosophers of the golden age of Islam, many of them were not Arabs. They were Persians and Jews and Greeks and Egyptians and Indians. So you see just how much complexity you can have in a simple title. So now for convention's sake, we will stay with these uh, names, with this nomenclature, but uh, I want the students to realize just how much possibility and promise and depth and complexity there is in this region, which is whether we like it or not, uh, we cannot challenge that it is the cradle of civilizations. Human civilizations as we know it started 15,000 years ago uh, in the plains of current Iraq. All the monotheistic religions, Christianity, uh, Judaism, Islam were born here. Uh, so it is a region that the students should know, not to become Islam specialists, but I hope at least one of you will leave this session and learn the languages of the region, learn the cultural issues of the region, learn the question of the ethics of the region, learn the politics, the economic complexities of the region. So uh, my hope is that from this session, uh, where we can only, only really scratch the very surface of the topic, because as I said, this topic is so complex, that you will leave with an excitement for an area of the world, which really to this day, I have to say is difficult to match in terms of its diversity, religious, linguistic, food, cultural diversity, and which I hope the Japanese will discover more ardently. Now, uh, what will we cover? Uh, the thematic, as Kumagai-sensei had uh, informed me, is uh, we need to think uh, and many people are doing all over the world, which is wonderful. We need to think about this new post-COVID world, if ever it's going to become post-COVID for one. Uh, and uh, I think because of the times, we need to also talk about the Ukraine war. When I was asked to give this talk, there was no Ukraine war. But today I think there have been many dynamics that have changed because of this war. So the first part, I will briefly touch upon why this topic. Uh, on the second part, I will really try and stick to definitions, geographical definitions, religious definitions, linguistic definitions. What do we, we mean by the things we say? Uh, we will not have time to uh, cover all the points I've mentioned here, but uh, this is a sort of rough uh, chronology of this whole area, uh, what happened, and it goes all the way, I would say, till now, but most especially till the Arab Spring of 2011. Some of you who have followed the politics know that there were great uprisings in Egypt, in Algeria, in Libya, in Tunisia, in Morocco, in Iran. 
uh, around 2011, and all of them practically, except for Tunisia, have been crushed. So what does that mean? I think this is uh, really important uh, to touch some of these points, but I will make all these slides and uh, reference material available. So hopefully uh, you can go over them uh, later. And then the last and third part is to basically say uh, what is happening now and where are we headed or have some idea because it, it does sound pompous to say we know where we are headed but it's such a complex region but to have to look at some of the reforms and movements that are occurring now uh, and then Q&A which is uh, the the gift that you will be giving me so I hope that uh, throughout you will have uh, some good questions uh, to discuss together. I do want to say that uh, frequently I will switch between BC and AD, you know that we usually use before Christ and Anno Domini, but this is a region with many religions and uh, I will be sticking most of the time and notes will be sticking to BCE before current era or common era and CE, which is common era or, or current era. Okay, so um, regarding the, the original uh, influence or the original impotence of this uh, lecture, I think uh, COVID-19 made very clear uh, our inter interdependence, our fragilities, uh, and put to the fore this really unhealthy relationship that we have had with nature, our attitude towards other living beings, our attitude towards nature. Uh, I think um, the pandemic really uh, woke a lot of people. I hope that the state of uh, awakening will remain, will not dissipate, but I want to remind some of maybe the older members, most of the students are probably, were not even born then, but, uh, Almost 30 years ago to the day, June 1992, uh, the world hosted in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, probably what was till then the greatest environmental conference of history. Even Stockholm in 1972 did not match it. It was called the Earth Summit. The Earth Summit will be 30 years old next month. Uh, I headed the small UNITAR delegation to the Earth Summit. We were so excited. We thought things would change. Uh, uh, climate change convention was signed, biodiversity, desertification. 30 years hence, uh, and I think the pandemic really brought that home, I don't think we have learned much. I don't think much has changed. There is a ver awareness intellectually. It hasn't really changed our attitudes. So, uh, this is one reason I think uh, that these kinds of conferences are really important and the role of religion, because that's where I'm trying to get, that we cannot ignore uh, the most important belief of billions of people in terms of the influence it can have in our relationships to one another and in our relationships to nature. The second point that the Ukraine war has brought to the fore, again, maybe some of the faculty will remember, some of the older generation will remember, there was tremendous hubris in the 1990s in the Western world, in where we lived, sort of liberal capitalism. Uh, there was Francis Fukuyama's 1992. He wrote a book, End of History, he was a political scientist at MIT. He basically said the Soviet Union lost, communism lost, uh, liberal capitalism has won. And in response to that, a historian of University of Chicago, I think, Samuel Huntington, wrote a, first an article which became a very famous book, which has made a lot of ink and a lot of enmity across the academic and popular world. It's, it was called The Clash of Civilizations in 1996. I won't go into that, but basically what Huntington was saying that there were eight great categories of civilizations. And he said, by no means, the end of history is not here. It has not ended. We will have other conflicts, but they will be civilizational. And one of the most prominent of those would be between the Muslim world uh, and the Christian world. 
And he may be with hindsight, he made the extraordinary mistake to say that, for example, it will be unimaginable to think that Christian Orthodox countries would go to war with each other. Well, uh, less than 25, 26 years later, Russia, Orthodox, Christian, Slav, uh, Russian speaking, attacked its smaller brother, Orthodox, Christian, Slav, uh, speaking a language not too different from Russian. Uh, we can see that the clash of civilizations is not the only threat. And all these ideas, and in particular over the last few decades, this idea that all war and terrorism comes from the Middle East, comes from the Islamic world, we can put that to rest. I think the Ukraine war has completely discredited the idea that human beings are not capable of going to war with each other for reasons uh, other than religion. So in this, uh, why this topic? Well, because I believe uh, these issues are not just for the specialists of the Middle East. They are not just for the specialists of Islam. Uh, why this topic? Because I'm absolutely fascinated and a large part of my career has been about post-conflict reconstruction, about comparing cultures. Uh, the advantage of having lost most of one's roots, because I'm born in Iran, but I haven't been able to go back for the last 40 years, 40 some years, uh, because of the Islamic revolution. Uh, losing one's roots has the advantage of broadening maybe shallower, but broadening one's roots. So my passion is comparative cultural studies. I want to understand why at a given time, some countries, some communities do better than others, but not to look at them in a very short term or even medium term, to look at them over long spans of time, because I think that's how history is understood. And of course, living in Hiroshima, let me see if I can do this. I don't know if you can do this. Well, it's going to be very small, but I am looking right at the Peace Memorial Park and the Hiroshima Atomic A-Bomb Dome. And living and working in Hiroshima, uh, really one, makes you doubt about the sanity of human beings, but two, uh, makes you very aware as to why some countries and communities can reconstruct uh, why this city that was just radioactive ash has become this beautiful green city and why some countries again and again fall into the trap of war and self-destruction cannot pull themselves together. So that question has constantly been on my mind as someone born in the Middle East and seeing what is happening to many of the countries of this beautiful region. This is a very key question for me. Um, and of course, uh, I do want to say again, uh, to maybe counter later on, uh, questions about this. Actually, this is something we always uh, debate and often dispute at the family dinners because uh, most of my relatives, having seen how terrible uh, the behavior of the Islamic Republic in Iran has been, uh, also believe that there are lots of problems with Islam and that it can be a source of violence. And I absolutely, I mean, there are lots of problems uh, with the institution of Islam, uh, but I, I can debate uh, till tomorrow uh, the fact that it is purely Islamic. If you look at the horrors of the 20th century, Hitler was a Protestant. Uh, Stalin was, by all accounts, an atheist. Mao was an atheist. Uh, if you look at the genocides in Rwanda and Cambodia, if you look at the bitter battles in Northern Ireland, if you look at the current human rights abuses, whether it's in Catholic Venezuela, in Sudan, in Myanmar, um, I think it's too simplistic to just talk about a religion because it's an easy way out and it sort of distracts us from more subtle issues that could be fueling 
uh, this violence in communities and societies, this need for war. Um, and I, I come back to this point for me personally, um, it is impossible to discard off the cuff uh, the beliefs of 1.6 by some accounts, 1.9 billion by some accounts, Muslims, imagining that 1.9 billion Muslims uh, really don't know what they're doing. That is, that is really a position that is self-defeating. Uh, for me personally, uh, the question is, how can we uh, work with religion to influence areas that are of interest to me. One of them is nature, as I mentioned, and here I have the book of uh, one of my uh, favorite scholars, Sayyid Hussein Nasr, he's an Iranian philosopher. Uh, of course, like most uh, prominent Iranian scholars, he cannot uh, live or work in Iran because the regime cannot tolerate intelligent people like him, so he's teaching in Washington, D.C. But already in 1968, he wrote a book called Man and Nature, where he tried to analyze the influence of the Quran uh, on environmental issues, the relationship of the Quran on environmental issues. Uh, the other book to the right of your screen, Humanism and Islam, it first came out in French. It was written by my longtime boss at UNITAR, Dr. Marcel Boisard, who is a very famous Swiss scholar on Islamic studies. And there again, looking into the Holy Quran to find references to human rights issues. And uh, the third one, which is new for me, it's the link I have put uh, at the bottom of the screen. Dr. Ramesh Kosi is a much younger generation. He's, he's uh, absolutely fluent in French and in English. He's from the small island of Mauritius but works in France. And uh, he has been doing a lot of work and writing on the relationship between artificial intelligence and religious beliefs and faith. Uh, while all this madness of war and the pandemic are going on, we are forgetting some of these key developments. Uh, artificial intelligence is really uh, around the corner and we have not found a way, we haven't spent enough time to think what will it mean for humanity and what will it mean for society uh, and to not engage uh, the religious or spiritual community in this debate about artificial intelligence. Again, it's shooting ourselves in the foot because billions of people continue to consider their faith their spiritual life as very important. So as researchers, we must find a way to see how can we make all this relevant to young people like the students who I hope are watching and not falling asleep uh, on this topic. And of course, for those of you who are um, have followed uh, the environmental movement in the Catholic Church, I think the current uh, Pope, Pope Francis, uh, the first uh, non-European Pope since the eighth century, uh, an incredible Pope, uh, and his, uh, he did an encyclical on the environment already in 2015, which was revolutionary. He's very, very concerned about environmental issues. He's very eloquent about environmental issues. So, uh, and he's not the only one, actually, the patriarch of the um, Church of Istanbul, of Constantinople, former Constantinople, Father Bartolomeo, is also, has been for 30 years, very outspoken envi about environmental issues. Why shouldn't we learn to, to understand and use these possibilities to address some of the issues that are going to haunt us in the 21st century? That is the main key point that I want to emphasize. Now, the greater Middle East, the, what is the greater Middle East? I'm going to work a little bit with maps um, uh, to, this is uh, the greater Middle East inclusive of Central Asia. Some of you who have 
heard these magical names, Tashkent and Bukhara and Samarkand. Uh, these are all in the purple areas. They are actually some of the far more open-minded uh, uh, Muslim countries. I will get back to that, actually. You're looking, as you're looking at the greater Middle East, you're actually looking at a very small portion of the Muslim population globally, which is ironic, even though the heart of the Middle East, the heart of Islam is obviously Saudi Arabia and Mecca and the region, but uh, in, in reality, in numbers, it does not represent uh, such a large portion of the Muslim populations. You see in the world map, uh, just what a strategic location this is. Of course, it's a very strategic location if you look at the land routes, right? So from the 16th, 17th century, where when the sea routes became uh, extremely popular and passable, uh, the land routes, starting, of course, with the original Silk Roads, uh, but all the land routes in this area got diminished in stature. But you can see that the area really um, covers, is a bridge between Asia, uh, Caucasia, Northern Africa, and Europe. So it's truly a crossroad of nations. And that's why it is also a crossroad of civilizations. Uh, okay, so I'm going to very quickly, because uh, I, I, I'm mindful, I asked Kumagai Sensei a few days ago, and I, I'm mindful that there are no branches of uh, religious studies or comparative religion at AIU. Uh, so, so a very brief overview. Uh, human beings have created gods. Uh, now we can say uh, in some parts of the world, money is the god. But uh, for a long, long for as long as we remember, as long as the cavemen in France 40,000 years ago were making drawings, uh, people human beings have sought uh, some sense to their existence, maybe partially out of fear, because once they observed, once our ancestors observed that we die, uh, the question of where do we go from here has of course haunted human beings, uh, but it has taken very different forms and just the variety and diversity of the forms that uh, religious beliefs and spiritual beliefs have taken is extraordinary. Uh, I emphasize this list is not comprehensive. I have not uh, added the very many um, important and influential uh, other religions. Uh, I'm really going to uh, run through this so that I can get to the monotheistic religions that is more the focus of this session. But ancient Greek and ancient Egyptians uh, had polytheistic beliefs, they had many deities, they had uh, all sorts of sacrifices, but no concept of one god. Uh, in Hinduism, uh, which has been, it is one of the most ancient uh, religions in the world. Uh, there are also many deities, um, but no concept of a single god. Uh, Taoism and Confucianism, which uh, incidentally, both of them appeared in China roughly around the same period, 5th, 6th BCE, uh, by Lao Tzu and Confucius. Uh, as their uh, great uh, philosophers, uh, were more about a way of life. They still are. Uh, they dictate a way of being, a relationship to family and community and society, and a personal conduct. But again, no concept of a unique God. The Mayan civilization, uh, similar, many gods and deities, uh, but until the arrival of the conquistadores, the Spanish and the Portuguese conquerors and Christianity, many gods, but no single god. Africa was roughly the same. Again, uh, it's Af in Africa, uh, many communities, and it's true, I, I found often many similarities with Japan's Shintoism because the cult of nature 
uh, is very present and anyone who's been to Africa, just nature is so overwhelming. I think it's totally understandable that that was the original uh, source of spiritual beliefs, but until arrival of Islam and Christianity. Uh, I do want to say as, as concerns Islam in Africa, uh, Africa is very unique, and in fact, many of the West African countries like Senegal, Mali, Burkina Faso, that are Muslim countries, are amongst the most tolerant Muslim countries. And the reason for that is that Islam arrived in Africa not by war or the sword, it arrived in West Africa by the missionaries and traders. So there's a very different relationship uh, between the local communities and Islam. And that's why uh, when we say we should look at the long history, that's why it's so important to understand why are the Senegalese, they are just beautiful people. And whether you are Christian, Jewish, atheist, Senegalese are so cool about it. And, uh, and I think that's really um, uh, the history of the arrival of Islam is very different to other parts. Uh, uh, Buddhism and the great Buddha, of course, uh, maybe one of the most powerful, I would say one of the most powerful religious leaders in the world. In his lifetime, he practically managed to spread Buddhism across most of Asia. Uh, going eastward, uh, but again, uh, there is uh, the concept of oneness, but it's not articulated as a one God. Uh, so uh, even though it's such a um, influential religion in, in Asia, uh, it's different from the monotheistic religions to which I will now uh, look. So I have put, uh, typically when you say monotheistic religions, there are three, the three Abrahamic religions. Uh, Abrahamic religions because despite all the differences that people want to underline, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam come from one line of descent from the prophet Abraham. Uh, and they, of course, they separated along the line, but uh, their sources are the same. In fact, uh, Arabs and uh, Jewish people, Israelites, are all Semites. So they are all from a Semitic descent. The similarities are enormous, and maybe because the similarities are enormous, the tensions also have been enormous. But I have added one more religion, partially because uh, it is a religion that has influenced a lot my childhood and my own upbringing in Iran. It was born in Iran. It's Zoroastrianism, Zoroaster. Uh, actually, people in Japan are more familiar with Zoroaster than they are with Islam in, in some sense. Uh, a lot has been written about Zoroaster by uh, many Western philosophers. Uh, thus spoke Zarathustra. There are all sorts of uh, books and music about Zarathustra. Uh, we cannot say that uh, his religion, and we know historically Zoroaster existed, uh, it wasn't exactly monotheistic because uh, he had this vision of the world being divided between good and evil. Ahriman and Ahura Mazda. So it was sort of a dualistic, uh, although the God of good, Ahura Mazda was a unique God, there was always this tension. And Zoroastrianism has now become a very small, uh, affects a very small group of people. Uh, many of the Zoroastrians fled Iran on the arrival of the Muslim Arabs. And in fact, you find the largest community now in India. So here then we have uh, the heart of the matter are three uh, great prophets, uh, the le leaders, individual leaders of their faiths, uh, Prophet Moses, uh, Jesus Christ, and Prophet Muhammad, uh, respectively leading their, being the leaders of their community. Uh, chronologically, uh, of course, we take year one, Anno Domino, for Jesus Christ. So our Gregorian calendar follows his birth. Uh, 
Moses, it is not exactly certain, but we think he lived in Egypt uh, around 13th century BC. Uh, sorry, there's a mistake there. It's BC. And um, Prophet Muhammad was born in 570 in what is Saudi Arabia today. Uh, now, this was the point I wanted to raise. Here we have, uh, uh, from the Pew Research, we have uh, the top 10 countries with their largest Muslim populations. And you can see actually that the top four, uh, actually the top five are not even uh, in the Middle East. They're not even in the greater Middle East. Uh, Indonesia is the largest Muslim country by far, 230 million, uh, followed by Pakistan, 212 million. India, although its uh, main population is Hindu, nonetheless has about 200 million Muslim population. And uh, Bangladesh has 153 million. Uh, Muslims, Nigeria, 95 million. And then you have Egypt, Iran, Turkey, Algeria, and Sudan. But you can see already uh, that the vast number of uh, Muslims do not live in uh, the greater Middle East or in the Middle East. So what could that mean? And I would come back to that in terms of the reform movements of Islam. What could that mean uh, for um, uh, Islam and uh, the transformation of Islam. Uh, now, the vast majority of uh, Muslims are Sunni Muslims, and about 90%. About 10% are Shia, uh, notably in Iran. Majority of Iranian Muslims are Shia, but we also have Ismaili. Uh, Muslims and we have other smaller sects. Uh, I hesitate to put Sufis and Sufism, uh, which I would um, subscribe to as being my own version of Islam, as a separate Muslim sect, because there are many Shia Sufi, there are many Sunni Sufi, there are many Smiley Sufi. Sufism is more an approach to the religion uh, that is more spiritual, uh, and less dogmatic and institutional. And we can discuss that in the Q&A if time permits. Uh, I do want to uh, bring your attention uh, to the light blue uh, indicators because the four countries I mentioned, uh, for those like myself who really suffer from the lack of women leaders in the Middle East, um, you can see that the non-Middle Eastern and non-Arab countries uh, have had, Muslim countries have all had women leaders. Indonesia has had Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh. So uh, this is for, for uh, those of us who are also fighting on that front. I think this is really a key point. Uh, I like to share this because uh, uh, my late father, uh, who absolutely loved maps, uh, would always say, when you're stuck and you don't understand history or politics, just look up the geography. And uh, I think geography often tells us so much. Now, this is actually a panel we have here. It's right here uh, at UNITAR at the office. I believe it was uh, obviously given to us by one of our many Afghan uh, trainees and visitors uh, because Afghanistan is the one marked right at the center of the great Silk Roads. But you can see how in the ancient times uh, and the, the people of the Middle East were great traders as well, not just the Arabs, but the Sogdians for a very long while. You can see how these routes were connected from China all the way to Rome and North Africa. Uh, more maps is uh, the spread. Uh, we saw the greater Middle East, but here you can see more clearly the spread of Islam. Uh, you can see uh, far flung areas in Indonesia, Malaysia. You can see all the Islamic countries 
in West Africa. There are some small islands and uh, Guyana in uh, uh, South America. And of course, there are huge Muslim populations in the UK from the time of colonies in Pakistan and India, in France, uh, because of the uh, relationship and colonial times in North Africa. So they're very large Muslim communities. France, for example, has about 5 million Muslims. So you can see that the spread and interaction is uh, quite intense across the globe. And of course, many Muslims um, now can feel that they can mostly live and work in Western countries, because if they're secular Muslims or if they're moderate Muslims, if such a thing exists, moderate Muslims, they uh, probably have a better time uh, sharing their ideas and thinking aloud in uh, Western countries, which is uh, another point of sorrow, this incredible brain drain uh, that especially the greater Middle East has been facing. Uh, here you see what we discussed uh, the, in terms of numbers and size, and uh, you can see more clearly uh, just how uh, large Indonesia, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Nigeria are compared, for example, uh, the map is maybe too small uh, for you to see, but compared to uh, Middle East proper uh, these are these are where the great populations are, and this could influence in the future, the thinking about Islam and on Islam. And of course, on the economic side, this is how the World Bank defines North Africa and the Middle East, Middle East and North Africa. They call them the MENA countries. Um, the MENA countries uh, usually do quite poorly. They have been doing very poorly over the last two, three decades. Um, huge unemployment, um, huge brain drain, uh, very high population growth, so incapacity to really uh, respond by some of the governments of the area to the rising demands uh, of this rapidly increasing population. So population growth is a huge issue uh, in the Middle East as well. Okay, now my, uh, I would like to come to the uh, sweetest part of um, uh, this talk, uh, what does it mean, uh, the golden age of Islam? Because we want to look back so as to be able to look to the future. And I'm mindful I have about 12 minutes, so I may speed up a little bit. Uh, the golden age of Islam, uh, I start with the period. It covered a period between the 8th to the 13th, some say 14th century. Uh, Baghdad was the New York, was the heart uh, and soul of uh, the golden age of Islam. Uh, it was the intellectual, the artistic, the cultural, the theological center uh, of Islam and the Abbasid dynasty. And it was a period of great flourishing and great flourishing, uh, not just by um, the Arabs themselves because the Arabs of the Abbasid dynasty had the wisdom to know that they had conquered these civilizations that had been there two, 3,000 years before. And uh, that was the case for Egypt, that was the case for Iran, that was the case for parts of India. Uh, so they were wise, that was the case for the Jewish communities in the region. Uh, so they were wise enough uh, to be very inclusive. And uh, selfishly, for vanity's sake, uh, the two great scientists of this era uh, that I have here, they wrote in Arabic and Persian, but they were both Iranian, although I'm sure Uzbeks will claim, uh, because both of them were born in what is today Uzbekistan in Central Asia. Um, they grew up in Persian speaking families and lingua franca of that time was Arabic. So they wrote in both Arabic and in uh, Persian. Uh, Ibn Sina, Avicenna by his Latin world uh, name, maybe is the one I would emphasize uh, because uh, many people, especially those of you who have done any medical studies know that he is called the father of medicine. Uh, Ibn Sina, uh, actually 
uh, was a polymath. Uh, polymath was, by that I mean that many of these uh, scholars of the Golden Age, it's absolutely uh, mind-blowing because they were mathematicians, they were astronomers, they were plant scientists, they were geographers, they were doctors, they were theologians, they were philosophers. It seemed to be the norm, unlike our time. Uh, that uh, people just tried to master as many disciplines as possible. The separations were not so great. Um, the book of medicine, I think it's called the General Book of Medicine of Avicenna, was used in Europe till about the 16th or 17th century as the reference medical book. And as to Al-Biruni, uh, Al-Biruni uh, is not as well known as Avicenna, as Ibn Sina, but Al-Biruni also, he was one of the first to travel a thousand years ago to India and write a book about Indian civilization. He too was a polymath. Uh, he spoke Sanskrit, he spoke Greek, Arabic, Persian, uh, extraordinary diversity of backgrounds. And uh, to, to the credit of Wikipedia, which uh, I have to say I have a great love for, even though it's fashionable to look down on Wikipedia in academic circles, but as a provider of basic information, until you are willing to deep, dig deeper, it is fantastic. The collection they have here, I won't go into it because it covered four pages of my slides. The number of scientists starting in the seventh and eighth centuries all the way to the 14th centuries that are listed in this link is absolutely extraordinary. And uh, I finally deleted all of them and kept a sample for you. Uh, but if you want to have a glimpse of what was happening in the greater Middle East, which today we only equate with terrorism and backwardness, well, you should have a look at the list of the kinds of scholars and scientists who could live, work, think and write freely at that time. Uh, this is the famous city of Baghdad that I mentioned, the same city that was uh, destroyed again and again uh, throughout the ages and most recently by the American bombings in its invasion of Iraq in 2003. Uh, the fall of Baghdad, uh, and I will come back to that in the beginning of the decline, the fall of Baghdad was the beginning of the end uh, of the golden age of Islam because the, the empire as it was conceived just uh, dismantled itself, uh, got more rigid, got more intolerant of diversity, and part of it was the trauma of this fall. Uh, Baghdad was destroyed like many of the great cities of the Silk Road uh, by the attack of the Mongols, you know that in the 13th and 14th centuries, the wave after wave of Mongol invaders came from the east, uh, they destroyed many of the great cities uh, on their path. Many of the great cities of the Silk Road uh, were destroyed. Uh, the level of destruction was breathtaking. I think it's uh, something that um, we often forget. So many of these great centers of knowledge actually never bounced back from that period. And uh, I uh, have to sort of run through the uh, events that led to the decline because uh, uh, for since the 14th and 15th century, basically this region has been either mismanaged or weakly governed during the Ottoman Empire, which lasted for 600 years, uh, where the different sects of Islam started fighting with each other, notably the Sunni and the Shia, uh, where maybe because of a lack of central authority, there is no pop in Islam. So I think this is really important to highlight. There is no central authority that will decide on the reform of Islam. Uh, 
But then again, Buddhism doesn't have a central authority and Protestantism doesn't have a central authority. So nonetheless, there is no one place where Muslims can say, let us go there and transform uh, and reform our religion. And of course, colonialism and the oil industry, which were uh, absolutely traumatic uh, for the region. Uh, there, are, there are many writers who look at the Islamic law as not being compatible uh, with the modern liberal capitalism ethos. I don't want to go there. Uh, they say that it's very difficult under Islamic law to accumulate capital, which is what allowed Europe to develop its corporations. Timur Quran, if you have uh, the opportunity and interest to look into this part, Timur Quran is one of them. He's a very eloquent um, economist who tries to bring uh, this long history into an understanding of why economically this region is falling behind. And finally, the third part, multifaceted decline requires multifaceted responses. And as I mentioned before, um, some of the most interesting debates about where Islam should go from here are happening not in the Middle East, the core of the Middle East, uh, not in Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, but happening in the margins. For example, North Africa. Uh, the three people I have here are all North Africans. Uh, the young lady on the top is the, she's originally from Algeria. Uh, the first imam, female imam, that is to say religious leader in France. She's challenging the male-dominated imamiyat, uh, very common in Islam. Uh, Fauzia Charifi in the middle is a physicist. She's a Tunisian physicist, uh, extraordinary uh, physicist who's trying to bring attention uh, to this, this rich scientific tradition of Islam. I won't go into all of the names because uh, we just don't have time, but uh, I also want to say that there are many who are trying to work on the cultural front. That is to say, uh, one of them is the Aga Khan Foundation. It's the Ismaili uh, religious organization. The Aga Khan Foundation does incredible work for example, in safeguarding Islamic architecture uh, across the Islamic world. They have very, very prominent competition of Islamic architecture. Um, and then meanwhile, uh, I have put it here, you know, China just this last month has started uh, raising the Kashgar's Grand Bazaar. Now Kashgar uh, was one of the hearts of the Silk Road. Uh, it's the Uyghur, uh, one of the traditional Uyghur markets, bazaars, great bazaars. Uh, such developments, of course, uh, make the Islamic world uh, doubt of the sincerity of other cultures and countries when they say that they want to engage in discussion and debate. Uh, on the more bright side, uh, there are some outstanding museums that are working hard to preserve Islamic art and architecture beyond the Middle East. Uh, as you can see, though, I have here the 10 most important. Uh, six of them are not in uh, Muslim countries, uh, but maybe that is a good thing because this is not just art and culture and architecture that should be reserved for Muslims to see. But it's important that Muslims get the sense of pride of the achievements of their civilization. Uh, and if you, perchance, you come to Okayama in my part of Japan, you will be surprised to know that there is a jewel, a jewel of a small um, museum uh, called the Orient Museum, which has absolutely breathtaking collections from 5,000 years ago, starting in Iran, um, Syria, all these countries that have been so devastated, Syria, Iraq, Yemen. Um, if you go to the Okayama Orient Museum, 
uh, you will be really, I think, surprised uh, by the depth and scope of this collection. And uh, the last word I will keep, uh, because we're talking about transformation and what will change, what can change. And I will say, uh, what can change the greater Middle East, maybe what can change the world uh, is more engagement by women. And this part of the world has done extremely poorly. And it is not a problem of Islam, it's a problem of the politicians and leaders uh, who absolutely want to keep half the population out of power, out of influence. Uh, I have here on the very left of your screen is my mother, and that's my brother and myself. Uh, this is uh, Tehran, Iran in the early 60s. Uh, early 60s, my mother, who came from a pious practicing Muslim family, uh, this is how she could uh, dress. And below we have the first woman minister uh, in 1968. She was a medical doctor. Uh, she was murdered by the leaders of the Islamic Revolution in 1980. Uh, they put a, a rice sack on her head and just shot her uh, because she refused to wear the veil. Uh, and even the revolutionaries in 1979 in Iran, so they were, they were actually pro-Islam. The woman you see on the right side of your screen were revolutionaries, part of the 1979 revolution. Uh, this is beautiful photographic collection now in the British Museum by a very, very prominent Iranian uh, photographer, uh, Hengame Golestan. And you can see uh, the women are, are debating uh, with that religious man. And sadly, we know that the woman did not win. And to come back to a country so dear to my heart, on the left-hand side, uh, you have Kabul University graduation 1960. Actually, I was in Kabul, I think it must have been 1968 or 1969. Um, and I recall uh, walking in front of Kabul University and seeing all these women, uh, young girl students. Um, and I do not want to sadden you and finish off by showing um, a photo of what the Taliban uh, requested just two weeks ago. They decided that uh, Afghan women needed to go back to the burqa as if the burqa was ever an Afghan tradition. It was, it was never an Afghan tradition. Um, they decided that on Mother's Day, which is really very poor <laughs> timing. Uh, and uh, maybe to finish by someone who is not uh, neither from the greater Middle East or from Islamic country, but it says a lot about Singapore, I assume. Uh, the current president of Singapore, President Halime Yaqob, who is a Muslim. Um, I feel that that model is possible and should be reachable uh, for all these countries. Uh, of which I am a part of, but in a sense, all these countries I feel uh, as humanity, we are all a part of. And I think that um, uh, if we keep that model in mind and we make sure that the women reach a position where they can influence, uh, it is also reachable. Maybe not in my lifetime, but I hope in the lifetime of the students at AIU uh, who will hopefully see a better, greater Middle East. Uh, so I think uh, I will finish here, Kumagai Sensei, and pass the floor to you. I will stop sharing my slide and escape. There we go. Well, thank you very much for your informative presentation. You have provided us kind of big picture of great Middle East, and also provided us a lot of food for thought. And again, thank you very much.